Well, I, I'm uh, just delighted uh, to be a part of the conversation and the harmony of voices here at Rubicon. And uh, it's been a, been a great time over here in the UK. Of course, we saved the best for last, Dublin, you know, and, and uh, I go home uh, from here. And I, I uh, you know, as, as we thought about the conversation here, uh, I think I wanted to begin by suggesting that, that part of what we suffer from in the world is, is, is kind of this uh, breakdown of relationships and, and that we're, we're made to love and be loved and yet we have so many obstacles to that and I, I can um, remember a story growing up. I grew up in the deep south, in case you can't tell, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's the Bible Belt and this, there's all kinds of odd parts of our culture like, uh, you know, we've got a country song that says, this house is protected by the good Lord and a gun and if you come unwanted, you'll meet them both, son. Um, so that's uh, it's my heritage. You know. um, uh, but, you know, I, I did feel well loved in the church and I... I had an incredible uh, group of folks taking care of me growing up, but I also began to uh, to see a lot of contradictions and struggles later that uh, you know kind of created confusion for me as a young Christian as I read the things that Jesus said and I looked at the church and didn't often see uh, them adding up and um, one of the stories I heard growing up, uh, I'll never forget, is about a, a homeless man that, that came to worship on Sunday morning to one of the fancier congregations, you know, and he came, of course, with all of his street clothes on and had bags with him, and he sat down up front, and everybody sort of looked at him like he didn't belong, and uh some one of the pastors came up and said, "Sir, I don't know if you've been here before, but this is the house of God, and I want you to do something. I want you to go out this week and and ask God what you should wear when you come to church." And uh, he left awkwardly, and a week passed, and the next week he came just as he had before, you know, wearing all of his street clothes and his bags, and sat down. And the pastor said, "I recognize you, uh, and I asked you to do something. Did you do it?" And the homeless guy said, yeah, pastor, I did. I asked God what I should wear, and God said he didn't know because he's never been to your church. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I kind of like that one because, uh, uh, you know, and it, it occurs to me that um, we, we've often been known for more for who we've excluded uh, than who we've embraced. And there was a, a study done in the U.S. by one of the major research polling companies, and they went to every state in the U.S., and they asked young non-Christians, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? And what they found was heartbreaking. Um, the number one answer of what young non-Christians in the states think of when they hear Christian is anti-gay, anti-homosexual. Number two is judgmental. And number th three is hypocritical. And as you read the list, it doesn't get much better. I'll stop there. But I assure you what they heard was not very good. And what was heartbreaking to me is that as you read this list, the, 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 what didn't make the list and the very thing that Jesus says that we should be known for, our love, you know, did not make the list, nor did most of the fruits of the Spirit, beautiful things like kindness, goodness, gentleness, right? And uh, uh, as I look at that, I think what became very clear is that we've come a long way from this community and this people that are meant to carry God's love in the world. And uh, I'm excited, though, because I think there are all sorts of subversive friendships like this one here at Rubicon of folks that want to be known by our love again, want to be known more for who we included than who we've excluded, more for what we're for than what we're against. And so it's a gift to be a part of a generative conversation. And I, uh, you know, as I thought about uh, a, a scripture that has meant uh, a lot to us in Philadelphia um, is, is this uh, text from Luke 16, and you know, I know a lot of us come from different backgrounds, so you may or may not be familiar with this scripture, but I want to offer it as a, as a 
framework for, for some of our discussion. And it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus, as it often gets called. And I'll read it to us. It, it, it goes like this. So Jesus is telling this story. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and they licked the beggar's sores. And the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus received bad things and now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. I know that's one that kind of messes up the, the vibe in the room. It's a heavy story, you know. Uh, I heard someone once say, we, we know when we've really heard the, the gospel because it comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. Uh, and this is one of those stories, but as I, I you know, I've read some of the the writings and teaching of the early Christians, and, and uh, the, there's a few things that, I, that have come out to strike me from this story. And the first one is this, this issue of names. You know, as Jesus tells the story, the rich man doesn't have a name and the poor man does. And I think there's something to that, right? That, that in, in uh, this, this naming, that uh, in, the rich, in, the, in this world, I'm sure the rich man had a name, probably that people recognized, might have even had a corporation named after him or a street, you know, and, and the, peop, the names that we know are often the rich and powerful and the poor, so many die without names and faces uh, in the margins and shadows of our world. And yet in the story, the rich man isn't given a name and could be any of us, um, and the poor man is. And he's, Lazarus is the only person who, only character in Jesus' parables who has a name. And his name means the one God heard and rescued. Uh, so as we think of that, I think this, this personalism that, that God knows the names and faces of those who we've often forgotten is, is there. And there's also this um, interesting issue of, of religion that it seems that the rich man apparently is a religious guy. I mean, he, as you read on, he knows the story. He calls Abraham father. He, he's kind of identifying himself with this story, but his, his religion did nothing to tear down the wall that he had built, right? And to move him in compassion to the person right on the other side. And so it seems that religion, you know, alone is not enough uh, unless it moves us in compassion to the, the most marginalized. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the last thing that strikes me is that this wall that he was hiding behind not only did it separate him from the poor, but it separated him from God. In the end, he, in the end, he finds that there's this chasm that's been created, right? That's not. And, and I think of walls, you know, and and we we build them and hide behind them often with this kind of idol of security, and yet like. Uh, uh, Sometimes we, f we think that we're locking out the suffering of the world, but we find that we're locking ourselves in, right? Because we're, we're, we're made to do something, to live bigger than ourselves. So we think of, you know, whatever those walls might be of, you know, picket fences and gated communities and office cubicles and screens and all of the things that create those barriers for compassion. And I want to invite us to kind of, you know, you know uh, think about the people that we might have locked out and the people that we might have uh, created those walls with. And I, I uh, and just as a little tool, I, I think art plays a great role as we think about these things. So I, I brought you a few images from an artist that you uh, you may recognize. Um, uh, and these are images of, among, you know, along the wall between Israel and Palestine, you know, arguably one of the most sophisticated walls that's ever been built to separate people from each other. And uh, there'll be a few images um, of, of uh, you know, Banksy's art along the, the wall there. But each one of them kind of, I think, invites us to see the people on the other side.
<laughs> That's great. You know, and, I, and as I think of my own journey, I think I, I easily could have lived and died uh, not seeing the suffering of the world. And, and, and almost everything in our world is compelling us to move away from the suffering, you know, and hide behind walls. And, and yet, um, I, I, when I went to college, um, I studied sociology and I studied the Bible and um, you know, I was, I was doing all that, but then it was when my college friends started taking me to the streets, and I got to know homeless folks that, like, it began to, and, and I got to say, when I first started going out to the streets, I was scared to death. I thought, like, I, I would get mugged, so one of my first experiences going down to hang out with homeless folks, I was so nervous, I left all of my money and my credit cards um, in my dorm room um, so that, uh, you know, I, they would be safe, and while we were downtown hanging out with folks on the streets, some Someone broke into my dorm room and um, stole all my credit cards and went shopping. Uh, and, and, you know, so I, I came to, to see how, how unsubstantiated a lot of my stereotypes are. And, and, and uh, I, I think what, what happened to us is we got involved in the lives of real people in our city and we started to see injustice. And, and, and the, what, what we started seeing in Philadelphia was... Um, that our city was passing laws that systemically discriminate against the homeless. And so Philadelphia began passing laws that made it illegal to sleep in public places, uh, illegal to sleep in any of the parks. Uh, it became illegal to ask for change on the street. Uh, finally, one of the laws that was passed made it illegal to distribute food uh, in downtown Philadelphia a law that we found problematic, you know, and so we, our, our uh, response was uh, to really try to expose that injustice in a way that might win over the hearts and minds of people, so not just to protest, but to figure out a creative way to, to really call into question these laws. So uh, one of the first things that we did was try to build relationships with congregations and different folks, and then we said, you know what, we're going to begin, uh, we, we read this beautiful passage in Luke's gospel where uh, Jesus is describing the kingdom of God as a banquet, but but the kingdom of God, as he describes it, isn't a banquet just for the rich and powerful, but the folks on the margins are invited to the banquet. So we said, that's what we need. We need a banquet where everyone is invited, and we proclaim this kind of beautiful vision that God cares for folks on the margins. So we gathered in Love Park and. Uh, downtown Philadelphia, we have a park called Love Park, and so we got a bunch of homeless friends, and we all gathered there, and we sang worship songs, and uh, and then we had communion, which was uh, pushing the envelope a little bit. You know, you're, we weren't, we were. It was illegal to distribute food, and uh, of course, if you're Catholic, you don't think it's food at all. But actually, the body and blood. So we're like, we're all Catholic here today, you know. But uh, we, we, uh, and the, but then after the communion, we we uh, brought in pizzas, and that was a little bit more, uh, you know, pushing the envelope. And we, you know, we all ate there together, and we slept in the park, and um, uh, we we continued doing that week after week, and then. Um, one day, all the police officers, officers were um, ordered to arrest us. So they came in, they arrested all of us, handcuffed us, took us to jail, and we faced charges. Uh, and we, as we argued our case in trial, I had a um, uh, shirt on that said, Jesus was homeless. And the judge said, come here. And then this is before the whole court. He says, Jesus was homeless. I didn't know that. And I said, yeah, your honor, in Scripture, Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And the judge said, you guys might stand a chance. And, and, and uh, we did, uh, you know, and we it began to make the news, and so we had all kinds of lawyers that came to support us. And we said, in all respect, we, we need all the support we can get, but we decided that we wanted to be spoken for by one of the folks on the street. And so our friend Alfonso, who was a smooth talker, we all knew as Fonz, um, he agreed to represent us. And uh, uh, so we go uh, to trial, and almost 30 of us are on trial, and, and uh, the Fonz stands up, you know, and there's, there's that scripture that says, don't worry when they drag you to court, the Spirit will give you the words. So we're like, give them the words, Lord, give them the words. And, and so he gets up and he says, Your Honor, on behalf of the group, I'd like to say we believe these laws are evil and wrong. And he sat down. 
we're like, well said, you know, and, and uh, the, the district attorney, the prosecuting attorney, she was not amused by any of this, and she was like throwing the book at us, she wanted us to go to jail and serve time, she wanted us to pay thousands of dollars worth of fines, and the kicker was she wanted us to have hundreds of hours of court-sanctioned mandatory community service. <laughs> but, no, don't make us feed the homeless, you know, and so anyway, we, we, um, we, 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 you know, argue our case, and, and in the end, it, it was a beautiful scene where uh, we had such huge support, and the, the judge was amazing. The judge ended up saying, you know, what's in question isn't whether or not these folks broke the law. It's very clear to me that they broke the law, uh, but what's in question is the, the constitutionality and the rightness of the laws that we're passing, and he said, if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we wouldn't have the freedom that we have, and uh, he said, uh, you know, that's just our story from the Boston Tea Party to the Civil Rights Movement. And if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we would still have slavery. And then he said, these guys are not uh, criminals. They're freedom fighters. I find them all not guilty. So we, it was a great day. And um, those same laws, sadly, 10 years later have surfaced again this year. Our mayor has made another uh, uh, executive order that feeding people in public places will be illegal. And we came out of the woodwork again and fought that. We actually had a Catholic theologian, so pray that we get the same judge. But anyway, you know, we, we, we actually had a Catholic theologian that argued that when we feed the homeless, we think it's sacramental. And so it, it, it's, it's actually that we don't just believe we're feeding some homeless person, but we believe that we're feeding Christ. And so to say that we cannot feed the homeless is to say that we cannot feed Christ and that it's a violation, one, of religious freedom uh, and of human conscience. And when we come before God and God says, when I was hungry, did you feed me? We won't say, sorry, our mayor wouldn't let us. Um, we actually won that one this year, too, and a federal judge said that it is indeed a violation of religious freedom to say that you can't feed the homeless. So it's sweet. You know, those victories, I think, are, are you know, ever coming. But I think what, what we've learned through that is the power of humanizing other people. And it's, it's easier to hate people we don't know. And, and that maybe one of the great tragedies in our world is, is not that we don't care about each other, but that we don't know each other, and, 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 and that, that really the, the, the disparity between the super rich and super poor fundamentally is a relational disconnect, and it's not that rich folks don't care about poor folks, but that rich folks don't know poor folks, and there's this danger that comes in anonymity, right, and that's what so much of our world does, though, I think, especially with, you know, a lot of the uh, divide between the super rich and super poor. Um, I remember a documentary done on, um, on Nike uh, several years ago um, that, that uh, the documentarian goes in to Philip Knight, who at the time was the CEO of Nike, and is kind of challenging the fact that many of Nike's products are made, you know, on, on the backs of uh, uh, child labor and, and unfair practices. And so the documentary, um, documentarian kind of jokingly says, hey, I want you just to show me where your shoes are made and how they're made. Um, and, and I've got two tickets, first class on Singapore Airlines. We're going to go to Indonesia, and I want you to walk me through and show me how Nike shoes are made. And Philip says, oh, no, 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 I'm not going. And he says, well, have you ever been to Indonesia? And Philip Knight says, and I'll never forget, it's so powerful. He says, no, I've never been, and I don't plan on going anytime soon. And I think what, what we, we see is, is that, that when, when we build those walls, right, like whatever they are, whether they're economic walls, whether they're uh, social or political walls, or like the, you know, the conflict here, who I, which I don't pretend to, to have the answers to or even understand, but I think that, that part of it is, is that it is always easier to, to hate those we don't know and to... Uh, talk at each other rather than with each other. And so there was power, you know, a, a day or so ago when, when, you know, Pat McGee and Joe Barry tell the story, right, of the con that humanized this conflict, that someone who had killed, you know, uh, that their daughter is, is now in this reconciling friendship. And do you know about this, right? This was in uh, uh, w the day before I was, I, I came, um, Pat McGee, who had, uh, been a uh, done done a bombing and killed the 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 father of this young woman now who is um 
forgiven him and Joe Barry, you know, they were, they, they were having a conversation about reconciliation um, in Belfast the day before I came. And, and there were, you know, all kinds of protesters and things. But I think any time that we, we try to build those friendships, there's power when the walls crack. And, and uh, just to, to share from, from our side of the world, you know, when, when 9-11 happened, um, the, the, there were all sorts of things that happened where people tried to um, deal with their grief and their anger and their fear, right? And so, so uh, some of those expressed themselves in really terrible ways. I mean, uh, in Philadelphia, right after September 11th, a banner was dropped from City Hall that said, let's kill them all and let God sort them out. So those were the ugly expressions, right? And, and we don't even know who them are. We just know them, you know? And, and, and then there was another voice, though, that was so powerfully redemptive. And these were victims of 9-11 that got together, um, and they had lost their immediate loved ones. So these are family members who lost their husbands, wives, children, mothers, fathers. They got together as a support group after 9-11. And as they gathered, they... Um, they began to, you know, pray and, and, and grieve together. But then as they saw the war ensue, their, their kind of prayer and, and motto became, our grief is not a cry for war. And they became known as Families for Peaceful Tomorrows, one of the most credible groups against the invasion in Iraq and Afghanistan. And many of them went over to develop friendships with people in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's part of what inspired me, as, as some of you know, to go. I've, I've been to both Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and it was to try to humanize, humanize those that we were only seeing on the news as enemy. And when I got to Iraq... I had some of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. I mean, every time I've been there, it's just, I mean, been life-changing. But my first experience was in, in uh, March of 2003 during the, the shock and awe campaign, during the bombing of Baghdad. I lived in Baghdad and, and gathered with uh, other doctors and nurses and volunteers and pastors, and we worshiped with uh, Iraqi Christians. And one of my most power I, I'm not going to get to tell you all the stories, but one of my most powerful stories in the world was right before the bombing, I, we, we went to this um, interdenominational prayer service praying for peace, and um, uh, we sang Amazing Grace in Arabic, and it, it was this ama just incredible experience. And uh, afterwards, I, was, I had tears rolling down my face, and I, I met with one of the bishops, and I said very ignorantly, I didn't realize it at the time, but I'm like, I had no idea there's so many Christians in Iraq. And he said, this is where it started. Uh, and, you know, pointed outside and he goes, that's the Tigris River and the Euphrates. Have you, you, you heard of them? The, gar the Garden of Eden was right down the street, you know. And, uh, and so and he, says, he says to me, he says, you, you didn't invent Christianity in North America. You just domesticated it. Uh, and he said, you go back and you tell the church in North America we're praying for them. And so the, those experiences, you know, I had my eyes opened in so many ways, but it was because I was there, right? And I saw these people who I, you know, were, were blowing away my stereotypes. And probably my most powerful experience was as we were leaving Baghdad after a month there, I mean, the, the things were changing and we felt like we really, many of us needed to come back and try to do work back in our own country to, to um, challenge the patterns of, of violence and to tell the human stories of what we had seen. But on the way out, we, um, we had a car accident. And, uh, I mean, it was surreal. Bombs were falling. You know, cars are on fire. Bridges are down. So we're driving through all that. We, we have an accident that flips our car over. It's a really bad accident. All of us were, were injured. Um, I was one of the, the least injured. And so I'm trying to help everybody out. Our car's on its side. We pull everybody to the side of the road. And one of my friends has a head injury. And, uh, and so we're, we're just trying to make sure he's all right. We have no idea what we're going to do. You know, we're sitting on the side of the road and there's not much traffic, you know. And so the, the planes are still flying over, dropping bombs. It's just I mean, it's, it's traumatic. And, and then the first car that's petering down the road stops and uh, it's a car full of Iraqi guys, and they jump out, and they wrap their arms around us, and they take us into their car, and they drive us into the nearest town, and these Iraqi doctors come out, and they 
take us to the hospital, but then they tell us, we need to tell you that the hospital has been closed. And we're like, why? And they said, uh, one of the bombs hit it, and it fell on the children's ward, and the whole hospital is closed. And, and I mean, we're just stunned, you know, taking all that in, but we're also thinking, well, what do we do, you know? And, and they, this doctor said, don't worry. He said, we'll take care of you. And he said, it doesn't matter to us if you're American or Iraqi or Christian or Muslim. He said, when we look at you, we see our own flesh and blood. And uh, they set up a shanty clinic and saved my friend's life. And, and my immediate response is like, this is unbelievable, right? And so I start thinking, how can we thank them? And my, my American mind naturally goes to money. And uh, so I start getting all of the collective money that we have in this huge pile of Iraqi dinar, right? And I go to the head of the hospital and I say, we just want to say thank you. And I get, you know, give him the money. And he goes, you just want to say thank you then say thank you. <laughs> and he says, you can keep your money. He says, we, we want to make sure that you know there's no other reason that we're taking care of you except that we love you. And he said, if you go and you just tell people what we did for you, that's all we could ever ask in return. And so we've been telling that story for, you know, like uh, 10 years. And, and we, in fact, had a Christian community that started that is named after that little town called Rutba. And the, and the community is committed to peace and reconciliation. It's a Christian community down in North Carolina in a, in a little town called Durham. And it's always been our dream to go back. So we, we recently... Um, got to go back to, to Rutba, you know, and, and we go, we, it's not easy to travel from the U.S. to Iraq, so we jump through all the hoops, we get in, and we go, and I got to tell you, it's the most amazing, like, welcome I've ever seen. We're, we're, we're like royalty or something. When we come into this town, like, they're lining the streets, and, they're, and, and, and the mayor's there, you know, and they said, uh, you got to understand, we don't get many visitors, and they said, uh, we remember when you came, you know, uh, and, and, and we've been moved that you came back, and they said, at first, we thought you must have forgotten something really valuable, but then when you came back, we thought that you just want to build the friendships, and they said, uh, so we, we, we want you to meet with the mayor. They took us to the mayor, and they, they did say, incidentally, they said, now, there are a few people that might want to hurt you or kill you, and they said, but don't worry. It's only a few, and, and, <laughs> And we will take care of you, they said. And so they slept by our beds with AK-47s every night. And I, I thought, that does not fit into my theology, but I'm very grateful for your hospitality. And, and, and we meet with the mayor, right? And I'll, I'll just cut it short, but we meet with the mayor. And, and, and the mayor is, is so excited as we tell the story. And, and uh, the, the mayor says to us, he says, this is the stuff that moves the world. And he says, we need a friendship uh, to continue, and we need a sister city in the United States. And I'm like, Philadelphia. You know, I'm like, it's a city of love. And he's like, no. I'm like, Sweet, whatever you say, sir. And he says, Philadelphia is too big. We're a little bitty town. And then he says, we need a small town in the United States. And then he starts talking to his friend in Arabic. And he says, I've only been to one town, a little town in North Carolina. It's called uh, Durham. Have you heard of it? I can't even believe it. You know, like I immediately just I fall apart. And I'm like, do you understand? We have a community that's been inspired by this story and by what you did for us in your town. And it's called Rootba House, named after your town. And it's in Durham. And the mayor goes, then it's done. <laughs> and then he says, and we will start a house of peacemaking and hospitality in Rootba, Iraq. And we'll call it Durham House. So those... Those friendships continue, you know, and, and I don't know where they'll end up, you know, and we're, we're trying to collect some money that we can uh, rebuild the hospital that was bombed. And so if you've, you know, you got $100,000 or something, just holler at me afterwards. But, you know, the, but as we, it's more about those friendships. And I, I, I'm convinced more than ever before that, that when we do the hard work of, of breaking through those illusions of, of the walls and the, the ways that we've insulated and isolated ourselves. There's, there's such power in that. And I, I think in, in the end, uh, Jesus, part of what Jesus was doing was creating subversive friendships and getting people to the table that would never be together naturally, right? That they would not be a tax collector and a zealot 
might not be inclined to have dinner together, right? Zealots like killed tax collectors for fun on weekends. So the, like, like, like the, 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 that vision, you know, of uh, whether it's, uh, you know, someone that's uh, of a, a conservative or a liberal or a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever our divisions that we have, when we come to the table together, and this is what drew me to, to Rubicon. It was really to the, the value of, of trying to see through each other's eyes and hear each other's perspective. And in the end, that maybe we might tear down some of those, those trapping walls that have been built up over the years. And, uh, you know, the, we, we always exclude people. Sometimes when we get, you know, for me, sometimes I'm, I'm inclined to, to build a wall with rich folks or folks in power, but I'm all, I'm always uh, I always have those those walls challenged. I was in Texas and I was speaking in Texas, and um, uh, this guy came up to me and he's like, "I got to tell you, I'm a redneck, gun toting, pickup truck driving redneck. I'm a cowboy from Texas." He said, "But I started reading your books," and he's like, "It has messed me up a little bit." He said, "I, I I'm a recovering redneck now," and he says, "You pray for me, you know." And and as I look at the scriptures, that's part of what I love is that that. Really, what we're required to do is to have humility, right, and to to realize that 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 we're we're all being transformed, and that should give us grace with each other. So that's why I always, when people ask me, you know, when they say, "Oh, Christians are such hypocrites," I'm like, "Great, you'll you'll be right at home among us." You know, like like that. Really, if we can have the humility to realize that we see through a glass dimly, and and that maybe others can help us love better, and help us see the world more broadly than. Than, than what a gift that is, and uh, uh, so that that's my prayer and, and my hope, and through conversations like this, I, I really do hope that a generation from now, when, when people hear the word Christian, uh, they don't say anti-gay, judgmental, and hypocritical, or whatever ugly things that they might say, but that they might say love, and joy, and peace, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the things that people said when they, when they met Jesus. And, and uh, what I would love to see is a, a Christianity that's known uh, because of our love and, and a Christianity that looks more like Jesus again. Uh, and, and I think that should also make us really good collaborators with folks who are not Christian. Uh, so, if, you know, if that's your story today, I, I think it's, it's a shame that often we Christians have been... Um, really quick to work with people who agree with us and really quick to build walls instead of bridges with folks who would be after many of the same things that they are, but they don't share our faith or our theology. And I think Jesus was a really great collaborator. And as we see in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he was actually challenging the religious community. His harshest words, like brood of vipers, right, are not for people on the margins, but it's for the people who thought they had the monopoly of good, Right, that they were the center of everything that God is doing, and to them, I think He's saying, "No, God, God cannot be confined to that. You know, God can work wherever God wants." And and uh, so Jesus consistently challenges the, the the chosen and includes the excluded. Uh, so may we do the same. Thanks so much.